Thank you, Lord, as we look into your scripture tonight, Lord, about you being that shepherd, that door to the sheep, and that we being the sheep of your pasture, God. Teach us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated and let us take our Gospel of John and turn. Yes, we're in chapter 10 now. Moving right along. We had a good time in chapter 9 for a couple of weeks learning about the healing of the blind man. We're going to talk yet a little bit about that tonight because it connects with chapter 10 pretty importantly. So chapter 10 of John is the great sheep passage or shepherd passage. Let me read it for us. The first 10 verses is what we're looking at tonight. We're going to be in this chapter for a number of weeks talking about sheep from many different angles. But verse 1 through 10 goes like this. Follow along in your own Bibles. It's not on the screen. Jesus is talking and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him, because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Love that passage. Father, we just want to take a moment before we tackle this that, Lord, you would just be the teacher through your Holy Spirit. We understand that we're talking about you being the good shepherd. We understand that we're the sheep. We understand the thieves and robbers that aren't you. We understand generally what Jesus is saying. But, God, would you bring some new insight into our hearts, some new love for you, some new appreciation from you as the shepherd, and maybe some some new insights about what this passage might be sharing. Therefore, we ask, God, that you be the teacher through my words and my teaching and give us hearts and ears and minds, Lord, to understand and to receive what you'd have for us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So you know John is the book of the I Am statements of Jesus. And this is the third of seven that we get in John. It's pretty famous that he says seven. We're going to look at all seven before we're done. The first, we, we, we look back at chapter six, and Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And he wasn't just saying, I am the bread of life, like you might say, I am a male or I am a female. He was saying, I am the I am and only the bread of life. No other bread of life. And that's from John six. Notice that that I am a bread of life relates perfectly to his feeding of the 5,000 bread feeding of 5,000 by bread. Then the second was, I am the light of the world. We saw that both in chapters 8 and 9, and particularly it relates to the, to the blind man's healing that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. The light of the world, he gives light, obviously, to his eyes, and he lets him see. That's pretty easy to remember that also. And then this is the third that we're looking at today in verses 1 through 10, where Jesus says, I am the door, and specifically the door to the sheep or to the sheepfold. And only through me can one go in and out. And chapter 10 it relates to Jesus as the only legitimate entrance into God's sheepfold. 
Now, of course, we know most of us that in John 14, he's going to say something similar when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But here it's even, I think, more specific. I am the door. I'm the way in and out. And we're going to see how important that is. So we're in the third of seven I am's here as we look at this famous passage today. And again, all of these seven I am's only in the Gospel of John. None in Matthew, none in Mark, none in Luke. So again, John specifically is trying clearly to show that Jesus is the I am. Now, I want to give you the connection between chapters 9 and 10, because there is a connection. The first thing you'll see up there on your screen is there is a debate whether 10 immediately follows 9. And it, it's true. Chapter 9, of course, tells the story of the healing of the blind man. And the last thing we we see is that there are some Pharisees in verse 40 of the previous verse, if you're looking at your Bible. The Pharisees said these things and said, we are not blind too, are we? And Jesus says, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But because you think you see, your sin remains. I want you to understand that there is no chapter division between 9 and 10. Now, that's true of all chapters. I mean, the chapter divisions were added after the scriptures were written. But here's what's even more interesting. There's no paragraph division between chapter 9 and 10. Whoa, almost every chapter of the Bible begins with a paragraph. So that's a little hint that maybe they're attached, okay? And I think that chapter 10 seems to teach the spiritual lesson of chapter 9. Did you know, by the way, that in the Gospel of John, whenever Jesus says, truly, truly, or verily, verily, or I most surely, whatever your version says, Every time in Gospel of John, it always follows a healing or a happening that Jesus teaches on. So it makes sense that here again, he's teaching on chapter 9. Now, how is he doing that? Well, what happened in chapter 9? Jesus called out one. Of all the people he could have called, he called out one, went to that one, and healed that one, and drew him to himself. But as we found in chapter 9, it wasn't just about the healing of his eyes and of his sight, as wonderful as that was. It was about bringing him through the transition of him seeing him as a prophet, seeing him as one sent from God, seeing him as a special person, until finally he sees Jesus face to face, and he falls down and worships him as Lord. We see that Jesus calls out one who had no spiritual understanding whatsoever, who is both spiritually blind and physically blind, and gives him both physical eyesight and spiritual eyesight to see him as the great I am. Pretty impressive. In other words, the shepherd went to a lost sheep and brought that lost sheep into his fold through the door that he was and saved him. And so I think that chapter 9 beautifully teaches the lesson of what is seen in chapter after chapter. And you, can, you, can dis, you can disagree with that, and there are those who disagree and so on. But I see a connection. And I also want you to notice who the audience is. There's also the thiev thievery and robbery. Who are the thieves and robbers, right, in chapter 10? Well, there's obviously the thieves and robbers in chapter 9, the Pharisees who just lambast this poor, newly seen blind man, saying, who is this guy? He don't, they don't care about his healing at all. And so they are thieves and robbers who try to snatch away his faith from him. But God's not going to let that happen. So I think that there's that connection. And then lastly, Jesus' audience in chapter, who's he talking to in chapter 10? It doesn't say specifically here. However, I believe he's talking to the same Pharisees and the same Jews who are standing around back in chapter 9, verse 40, and so on. The Pharisee says, we're not blind too, are we? Truly, truly, I say to you. And he starts teaching them about the shepherd that needs to come. And then he talks about thieves and robbers. Oh, my goodness. And if you look ahead at chapter 10 and slip, slip over a little bit into verse 19, we're not going to go there tonight. It's not part of our passage. But this helps us know who he's talking to. A division occurred among the Jews because of these words. Many were saying he has a demon. Others were saying these are not sayings of a demon, are they? So again, they're still struggling with who this Jesus is, just as they were struggling exactly the same in chapter 9. So take that for what it's worth. I think 9 and 10, at least the beginning of chapter 10, beautifully go together as a, in, as a set. And I think the most interesting point of all is there's no paragraph division between the chapters. Very unusual. 
that's not of interest to you, then we'll just go on to the next point. But I thought that was really interesting. Okay, now, we want to take a bird's eye view, if you will. Now, for Paul, who's here, we might call it a drone's eye view. It would be just the same, wouldn't it? I just want us to look overview of the chat. Let's just take a look in your Bible at verses 1 through 10. Just kind of glimpse at them. Now, if you have a red letter Bible, which many of you do, you'll notice that all of the verses are red. Except, yes, I know there's an exception, verse 6 in the very beginning of verse 7, which is John's commentary. If you don't have a red letter Bible, just notice that, there, that Jesus is talking in verses 1 through 5, and he's telling a story. Truly, truly, I say to you is the beginning of what he says in verse 1 through verse 5. And then this figure of speech Jesus spoke that they didn't understand it. So Jesus says to them again, and now in verses 7 through 10, he tells a similar story, just slightly tweaked to try to help them understand it. So our first bird's eye view of these is to, to notice that it's their words of Jesus primarily. They're divided by a statement that says, they didn't understand, so Jesus tries again, okay? Also, we want you to notice that verse 6 calls it a figure of speech. Now, I don't know what your version of the Bible says. Some call it a parable, which I think is a mistake. It's a poor translation. This isn't a parable. These aren't parables, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But it's a figure of speech. It's actually paranoimia, and you see the word I put it up there, paranoimia. That's what it is, paranoimia, which in Greek literally means something said by the way which means you're walking along or you're just having a conversation with someone like you do or just talking and say, oh, and by the way, let me tell you something. And it's supposed to be a saying or a teaching that makes a point, that tries to communicate a point. Now, it's specifically a saying that tries to communicate a point by comparisons, by comparisons. Who is the, who is the shepherd in the story? It's Jesus. You knew that. Who are the sheep in the story? And so you know what, you understand that, and you can go through. That doesn't mean that every single one of them, the gate doesn't have a, you know, who's the gate? You, know, you, don't, need, you, know, you need to go that, you know. But it's a, he's trying to teach by obvious comparisons. Now, I also want to point out that it is an allegory. I was sitting in English class once, and the teacher was trying to explain, what is allegory, suppose, what is an allegory? An allegory is a teaching aid meant to inform and be understood. That's up on the screen there. Unlike a parable, which was meant to shield truth. Remember in Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that Jesus told parables, but it says clearly that he told the parable so as to keep it from many of the Jews that were listening, to shield it from. In fact, the disciples had to even ask him after he told the parable, uh, <clears throat> what did that mean, Jesus? And he told them, because he wasn't trying to shield it from them. But when he told the parable, it was meant to shield. It was like a riddle that wasn't meant to be understood so easily. This is not that. This is an allegory, which is meant to teach by comparisons. And so when they don't understand it in verse 6, he tries again to teach them. So that's the bird's eye view of what's happening here. He tells them a wayside saying to try to teach them a point about what happened in chapter 9, by the way. We hear from John, the narrator, that they don't understand, they don't get it. So Jesus tries again, and again he says, truly, truly, starting the same way, I tell you, and he tells a similar one, but not the exact one. You there so far? Okay, so that's where we are so far. Now, having seen that bird's eye or drone's eye, Paul, view, Let's take a look at allegory number one. It's up on the screen, and there's a picture there that'll help you understand what's happening. And again, just to remind us, I already read it, but this is truly, truly, I say to you. Now, the truly, truly obviously means this is really important, what I'm saying. When he repeats that, and the King James verse says, verily, verily, some of your versions say, I most certainly say it's, it's of a, a, a real importance. But he's saying, I want you to really listen to this because this is an important teaching I'm trying to get across to you. So we listen especially carefully when Jesus says, truly, truly. I say to you, he who does not enter by the door, and already people are saying door, what's the door? What door is he talking about? Into the fold of the sheep, but climbs some other way, he is a thief and a robber. So he starts 
with the negative or starts with the, the robbery, starts with those who could climb in. Remember who his audience is. His audience is probably primarily not, not the disciples. because he, They're going to get it. But he's talking to the Jews or the Pharisees that are still standing there, still saying, we're not blind, are we? He says, those who climb by any other way but the door would be thieves and robbers. And they'd say, okay, he's talking about a sheepfold. Okay, yeah, I guess robbers would go in there. They probably got that part. That isn't the part they didn't understand. Now, they don't think they're the thieves and robbers. <laughs> they think Jesus is the thief and the robber. So they don't get that part. They don't get that he's talking about them. Going on, but he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens. Now, this is an important point. I want you to look at that picture there. It's a pretty good-sized pen. It would probably hold a couple hundred sheep. And notice, I don't know if you can see it with the light and the way it is, that on the far right side of the screen as you look at it, there's a gate. It's on hinges, and it would close, and it would, if not lock, at least it would, it would you know, be sealed and so on. This is, this is a particular kind of sheepfold that Jesus is talking about. It's one that would be found inside a city. It's one that would be shared by many shepherds. Two or three or four or five different shepherds would have their own personal flocks of 10, 20, 30, 40 sheep, something like that. And they would pay a small fee to this doorkeeper who operated this sheep pen and who would stay there by night and day, whatever, so the shepherds could go get a good night's sleep. And all the sheep of this shepherd and all the sheep of that shepherd and all the sheep of this and four or five different shepherds' flocks would all just mingle and go in there and the doorkeeper would close the gate, right? And he would stand there and be sure that the only one that came through that gate would be who? One of the shepherds. Nobody else was allowed in. He knew the shepherds. He knew the shepherd that had given him a shekel or whatever it was to, to hold that gate at night. This was commonly known by people. that This was in almost every single town. And so he's talking about a specific kind of of sheepfold with a gate that is closed with a doorkeeper. And so, so far, the Pharisees, who are the primary target of the audience, would understand what he's talking about. You have it so far? Okay. The doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. Who's his? The shepherd that happens to come. Shepherd one or two or three or four. The sheep would recognize that. And it's been shown, by the way, that, you know, the shepherd, for instance, I know my son, Kurt, has a separate little whistle for his dog. Have you ever gone down to Henry's Beach where they have free reign of the dogs running all over the place? Have you ever seen a hundred dogs running around and having a wonderful time in the ocean running around? And all, and all of a sudden, some master goes, or whatever it is, and that one dog says, I know that whistle, I know that voice, and comes right. Kurt has his own whistle. It's bum ba dum bum ba da bum ba -dum. It's from Peter Pan. That's Kurt's whistle. I can't whistle it. Anyway, and his dog knows that whistle. and he can, It's the same way with the sheep, and it's been shown that sheep know that. They know the voice or the whistle or the sound of the shepherd, and only the sheep that are his that makes that whistle come out among all those all mixed up, and they'll come out, and that's happened. And the, and the Pharisees would understand that. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name. I don't think he probably says, Hey, Billy, hey, Sue, Jim, come on. He calls them with a whistle or with a voice, and he leads them out. So understand that this first allegory is confusing to them. Why? Because they, kind of, they can't figure out who the thieves and robbers are, and they can't figure out who the shepherd is. They certainly don't think they're the thieves and robbers, and they are. And they certainly don't think Jesus is the shepherd. They've made that clear previously. So they don't get ex exactly what he's saying. So Jesus wants to get it clear to them. So do you have it so far? You understand. You understand. I don't have to teach you what the parables, what the allegory says. It's not a parable. So in verse 6, John, who is the author of this, narrates this and says, this figure of speech, this paranoia, this wayside saying, this attempt to teach by Jesus by way of comparisons didn't get through to their heads, but Jesus wants to communicate with them. The purpose is not to shield like a parable. He wants to communicate. So, verse 7, it says, 
Jesus said to them again, are you following along so far? Now he changes the allegory slightly. Now he's not going to talk about a sheepfold that's in the town that's shared with the doorkeeper and with shekels that you give to people and a bunch of different sheep. He's going to talk about a different kind of sheepfold. What kind is this? It's the one that's up on the plateau, up where the, out, out at night where the she shepherds stay out at night with their sheep. They're too far away from home or whatever, and they stay out there. And there are makeshift folds that are made usually with stones that they've just piled a bunch of rocks, maybe, you know, so high, so the sheep won't jump over them. And it's a smaller pen usually because it's only made for one shepherd's flock. Maybe 30, 40, 50 feet sheep might fit in it the most. And it doesn't have a gate. And it doesn't have a door. It just has an opening big enough for a sheep or for a shepherd to get through. And now you see, with that in mind, listen to this next story and see how it changes. And see if you can understand why now he's communicating in a different way. He says in allegory number two, oh, I should, I should before this, Next slide, Bill. I, I, I jumped ahead a little too fast. Here's the picture of the shepherd leading them out. I want to, I want to make special point of the fact that usually, how do you, what do you usually think of John, uh, uh, Psalm 23? We just read it and sang it, right? And we talked about it in, in the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil for thy rod and thy staff. What do you think that's talking about? Most sheep are driven by a rod or by a staff, right? That's not how Jesus does it. He's saying when, the, when he puts forth his own, he, this good shepherd that he's talking about, who is himself, he goes before them and the sheep follow him. Look at that amazing picture that's up there. That's unusual. This isn't, the, 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 the Pharisees aren't going to say, oh yeah, that's the way it's done. They're going to say, hmm, this is different. Isn't that a great picture? And the sheep just kind of follow. Why? Because they know his voice. Now he's talking spiritually. Now we understand that when Jesus, Jesus doesn't drive us. Did you think, did you know that? Jesus doesn't push us. Jesus doesn't kick us into heaven. He nudges us by the spirit, but he leads us. And he guides us. And he leads us into those pastures and the still waters and the so on and leads them out. So as we, as he, as we hear this, this parable, and, uh, I keep saying parable, allegory, come out. A stranger they simply will not follow but will flee from them because they don't know his voice. So he goes before them and leads them out. I think that's so significant. We're going to talk more about that in just a minute. But let's jump ahead now to allegory number two, which begins in verse 7. So Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, again, this is an important thing. Listen carefully. This is an important statement. I say to you, here's something brand new that he didn't say before. I am the door of the sheep. Whoa, you're the gate? You're the one the gatekeeper opens? No, he's thinking of a different, different pen. You can see this in a minute. All who came before me, notice the way he says this is different. Before he said, all who come climb over the edge are thieves and robbers. Now he's talking about all who came before me. Now he's trying to identify the me as the shepherd. You see the difference? You see it? Shake your heads. You see it. Before he's just talking about a shepherd. Now he says all that came before me. So Jesus is saying all who've come before me, like you Pharisees, like the false prophets, Anybody that's tried to call himself a Messiah before me, all that have come before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Do you see that picture? I don't know how clear it is to you on the screen. But do you see the shepherd sitting in the entrance way? He becomes literally the door. And that's what happens up on the mountain or on the plateau at night. Not in the city. They go sleep in a bed somewhere. And they pay a doorkeeper to watch their sheep. 
But up on the mountain, there's no doorkeeper. There's no gate. There's no door. There's just an opening. And he lies, does the shepherd, in the opening and becomes literally the door so the sheep won't go over him. So literally, he's the door, as well as figuratively and spiritually, he is the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. Well, sheep aren't saved. So now he's changed the allegory to be much more about people than about sheep. You see it? He's still talking in terms of a sheepfold and about being a shepherd. But now he's saying, I'm, I'm getting a little deeper here. Are you understanding? Whoever comes through me will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture, just as sheep find pasture by going in and out. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I, notice the I now, now he's personalizing it. I who am the shepherd, I came that they, not talking about sheep anymore, but people, that they might have life and have it abundantly. And of course, abundantly means overflowing. Just like in Psalm 23, my cup overflows. That's the abundance. It's more than I would ask or think. God gives us above and beyond, as Paul said it to the Ephesians, above and, all, above and beyond all that we'd ask or think. There's an abundance to his life, and there's an abundance to our joy. I remember age 13, I received Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Within a week after that, I was in Sunday school class with a teacher and three people. Myself, my friend, and his girlfriend. Really weird, really weird. But I remember the first thing, the first verse that I was taught that first Sunday, John 10.10. 10. <laughs> I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I didn't know it in context of the thief coming to steal and all that story about the, the door and all that stuff. I just knew it in context, the fact that God wants to give me an abundant life. That was a wonderful thing to learn as a young Christian. I hope that you've learned that, that God wants to give you abundance. Now, abundance does not necessarily mean longevity. Abundance does not necessarily mean freedom from problems. In fact, I can guarantee it doesn't mean that. Abundance doesn't necessarily mean a lot of money or house or car or everything, whoever you might want to dream might have. He's talking as he always does, does Jesus spiritually, that there's an abundance and overflow of the heart, an abundance that makes you want to share, that makes you want to go to church, that makes you want to read the Bible, that makes you want to love people that aren't lovable, <laughs> that makes you want to be a good person, that makes you want to stop doing those things that displease God. That abundance is an overflow that you never had before. I came that they might have life, and that life would be abundant and joyful. There's an old hymn that used to always bother me. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. That didn't bother me. <laughs> it was there by faith I received my sight. That didn't bother me. And now I am happy all the day. That bothered me. Because th the truth is I'm not happy all the time, even as a Christian sometimes. But I'll tell you what I am. I'm joyful inside all the day. I'm abundant all the day. I have a joy and a trust and a love of Jesus, knowing he's going to take care of me, even through the most dire circumstances. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So I wish it said, and now I am joyful all the day. I would, I would at least like that part better. Now, now I'm abundant all the day, but it doesn't quite fit. But the point is, the abundant life doesn't promise the American dream, if you will, or long life. The abundant life promises the inward, overflowing life that David was talking about when he wrote about my cup overflows because I have a good shepherd who's taking care of me despite the problems. So do you see the two stories? Now, I want to move on to one couple other quick points because I know our time's running out, but I want to point out to you that there is an am am amazing application to pastoral ministry. You say, really? <laughs> really? Oh, yeah, really obvious. And you're going to see it because pastors is just another word for shepherd. You know, it's the same word, to pastor, to shepherd, right? You call me Pastor Craig, I'm Shepherd Craig, you know. And so 
what does this teach us about those who want to be shepherds of the flocks? Number one, he must have proper entrance into ministry, taught the truth. He must come through the door. He must come through the door who is truth. And there must be a confidence that he has come appropriately through Jesus Christ and not through his own personal desire to come or to teach or to be taught or to be some celebrity or whatever. Secondly, he must have the clear calling of the Holy Spirit to shepherd. The Holy Spirit is often thought of that gatekeeper. Now we don't know, but that gatekeeper is like the Holy Spirit who opens the door to the shepherd. I remember my ordination questionnaire when 30 pastors came to question me to see if I was ready for the ministry. One of the questions that has always stood out to me, Craig, how do you know that you're called? Whoa. Because he was asking, was that person, you better be sure that you're called if indeed you should be going into ministry. You got to be sure the Holy Spirit has led you and it isn't just something that you are seeking or that somebody else says you should seek. That was a great question. If you ever want to know how I answered that, ask me afterwards. But I was confident that I had been called. And the Holy Spirit better, better, better call your, your leader, your shepherd. Thirdly, he, this pastor that's supposed to be, sees the sheep respond to his voice and leadership. That's pretty important. If the sheep don't follow, when the whistle comes, not literally, but you know, when the, hey, let's do this. That's not a very good leader. But if you're called by God and God wants you to lead, then you better kind of watch and see, are people following you? Are people listening to you? Do people see you as a leader? Fourthly, he is well acquainted with his flock, just as Jesus is with his. He needs to know his flock. That's why Drew and I pray for you by name every week. Now, we miss it sometimes. We don't get everybody. We try to. But we pray by name for every one of you. And that's the honest truth because we want to know you and get to know you personally. Is he leads rather than drives or lords it over his flock. I love that image. Whereas Jesus leads... We lead by example. If we're having a work day, we work with you. <laughs> if we go to minister, we go minister with you. If we're loading up the vehicles, we load up the vehicles with you because we want to lead by example, both spiritually as well as other ways too. And I think that's important. You think about a lot of pastors that don't do that. They say, here's what you're supposed to be doing. Go do it. And then lastly, he goes before and with the sheep as an example. Just the same as them. I'm no, I'm no sp more special or more important. We're equal brothers and sisters in the Lord. I just happen to have a calling that you don't have and you have a calling I don't have. We're just, we're just different people. We're brothers and sisters. We're equal spiritually in every sense of the word. And I think that although that application is seen very clearly in this. Let me show you one more set of slides and then we'll be done. Final lessons to be remembered. They're going to come up one at a time. No, 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 don't put the second one up yet. Thank you. Don't give it away. <laughs> Just kidding. Bill does such a great job back there. First of all, is this obvious? Sheep need a shepherd. You're a sheep. You need a shepherd. By the way, I'm a sheep. I need a shepherd too. We're all sheep and we need a shepherd. That's a pretty important lesson to learn from this, don't you think? I think. Secondly, go. Sheep fare best as a flock. Sheep don't, a sheep doesn't do very well by him or herself. Did you know that? In an actual sheep situation, they don't. They do much better when they are in a flock. That's what church is about. That's what fellowship is about. That's why we gather together. Yes, we can worship individually. We can do that. But it doesn't work so well. Sheep do best as a flock. It's true. Three. Thieves and robbers are to be avoided, but not feared. Jesus didn't say to fear those thieves and robbers. He just wanted to point out that they are coming and that they come in by the wrong way, but the sheep don't hear their voice. The sheep don't need to fear him. The sheep need to follow the, the, the shepherd. So be aware that there are thieves and robbers out there, but don't fear them. In fact, as it says in another, another gospel, fear God. He's the one to fear. 
Fourth, sheep must learn the voice of the shepherd. Do you know the voice of God to you? Have you learned his still small voice? It's hard to hear sometimes, hard to understand sometimes, easy to miss sometimes, but you need to learn that whistle or that tap or that still small voice that lets you know that you're on the right track or that you're not. Learn the voice of God. Fifth, sheep never need to be anxious under the good shepherd's care. Boy, we see a lot of anxiety among Christians that betray the fact that maybe they don't trust as much as they thought. We never need to fear. Oh, we're concerned and things are happening and say, oh, Lord, what's going on right here? But we trust. We're trusting these sheep. Trust that sheep. and Trust the shepherd. You need to trust your good shepherd. And lastly, you are not a sheep of God's kingdom unless... You have entered through the door who is Jesus alone. You may think you're a sheep. You may feel like a sheep, but you're not a sheep of his kingdom unless you've come through the door of Jesus. Those are pretty wonderful lessons to remember, are they not? Let's close in prayer.